Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, so thanks to Shreya and Autograph for inviting me for this last session. Um, I'm going to try to bring it home at the, end, at the end of the two days in this last session a little bit as well. Um, I'm Stephanie Henke. I'm a creative practitioner, a curator, and an artist, and I'm the co-founder of Tactical Tech, um, an organization I co-founded in 2003. I was very young, of course, then, uh, 20 years ago. Um, works internationally on the politics of data. Um, in my own work as an artist, I explore uh, questions of data extractivism, um, particularly extractivism of that data from, from the land, um, from large-scale corporate industrial collection of data focused on things like soil, water, and crops, and how that's commodified and turned into assets uh, around feed, fuel, food, and fiber. Um, and with a particular focus on um, synthetic using synthetic media, so AI and data, um, to think about how those landscapes are altered, those devastated landscapes. And the reason why I'm using um, technology and data often in that context is because the land is um, it's inaccessible, either through cost, like cost of data, or through things like not being able to document it legally. So um, this last panel is focused on data. Um, and, but my hope is that through this lens of data will come up some of the issues we've been talking about the last few days, uh, because data is really about encoding knowledge, um, and many of the issues like language, memory, and law, and other things we've been talking about will come up through those discussions about data. Um, and data brings questions of things like, you know, what is evidence? Uh, we heard that yesterday, you know, thinking about things like um, the importance of the, uh, alternative ways of thinking about evidence and data in terms of maps. Um, even this morning, you know, what counts and what is counted and by whom, and um, what data is collected. And when that data isn't collected, what is rendered invisible in that process? Um, and then thinking about how uh, data labor is performed and within what frameworks, which is going to be some of the um, panelists that we, we're hearing from today, we'll talk about that, and how value is generated, both in terms of money, in terms of um, dollars and capital, but also what's considered valuable or precious by who, and by whom. Um, and then the question as well we'll, we'll be looking at, I think, a little bit is who owns that data and what are the unique insights that are generated? Um, how does that uh, reinforce and extend power as well? Um, so to introduce the two panelists uh, today, we have two speakers. Um, the first panelist is, is actually going to show a film first and then she'll come and join us, Monica Alcazar Duarte. Um, so we'll see a film and, and this is really looking at some different questions we'll hear about in a minute, but including the question of what constitutes knowledge and who decides what knowledge is and who holds it. And then the second panelist, well, Julian will actually come and talk um, and respond to that film, Julian Posada, um, from the perspective, and from his own work, I hope he'll talk about that too, um, from the perspective of modern day centers of data and power like Silicon Valley and, and um, his work on new forms of data labor. So I'm just going to read their bios a little bit so you know who you're hearing from, and then I'll hand over. So... Um, Monica Alcazar Duarte is a Mexican-British multidisciplinary visual artist whose work acknowledges her indigenous heritage while exploring current ideals of progress. She embraces themes related to science and technology and the influence over society and the natural world. And in her project, she mixes images and new technologies such as augmented reality to create multi-layered work. In 2023, she was nom nominated for the Prix Picte and her work was acquired by the VNA. She's also been awarded a National Geographic Storytelling Grant and in 2022 was awarded a Wayfinder Award from National Ge Geographic, um, as well as a residency with Lightwork through Autograph Gallery in London, which I believe her work is in the, um, in the visit tonight that some of you will make to Autograph as well. Um, Monica has been granted fellowships by the Mead Foundation, Ampersand Foundation, Bartol Foundation, the British Arts Council, and her work has been exhibited and collected throughout Europe, Mexico, and the United States in places such as the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, the Autograph Gallery, and the V&A Museum in London. So that's going to be Monica's film you'll see in a moment. And then Julian Posada is an assistant professor of American studies at Yale University and a member of the Yale Law School's Information Society Project and the Yale Institute for Foundations of Data Science. His research integrates theories and methods from information science, sociology, and human-computer interaction to examine how technology is developed and used within various historical, cultural, and social contexts. His current project investigates the dynamics between human labor and data production in the artificial intelligence industry, incorporating elements of Latin American critical thought. This study emphasizes the experiences of workers in the region who are employed by digital platforms to produce machine learning data and validate algorithmic outputs. 
So I think we can go ahead with the film from Monica. Para entender el mapa del universo hay que empezar por el principio y para empezar por el principio uno necesita fuego. Es con fuego que la belleza es posible. Ukabelek antaka, un pechan cab hachak yabilma, porque un pechan cab da kashta, pul anka achit, menech akche makobo, u pulmo o kachi, tile de obema kanani, tone takcha kanante, porque hach usaki kakananke, lak of bish kabi, belang hachki makak olak, ak alak me hachki makak olak kanante. No pican estas abejas, ni hacen nada cuando las castran mal. Para castrarlas, no hacen más que abrir la colmena y reventar con un palito estas mejillitas y así corre la miel. Ikanta ko umpechan kab hach hachakia bilma porque umpechan kolmena tak kasta 
ti akanante porque chen chen be pula anka chi ento to ne tak cha eti ak kanante yo echan ka bach o tak ik hach ki maka ola kanante Tonga chica que hoy utzikbal ya mag, que ya acton bisco me yati, que ya acton bisha con ciente bisco me me tibik bisco me yati tu la que le cabo, pero ti su bien la ac ac me yaki ac ike la que le va cuye esa tono más importante ti toni más cana antoni, porque e cabo que ya acton va a su cate, que ya si acton bank ananti veo que viene canic bisco me ha dicho que viene canco un bisco un canante lo cada octubre que 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 viene que no ha dicho banca nante cabo veo viene que me ha dicho que mientras es más más canante un tulaca la que cansa he banca nante me que que canac uy pasco pasco ya actone cabo cabo canac uy banu cato y esto Cuando esta nueva vida surge, es como si lo que existió antes envaneciera. So, as the discussion for today, I went to this morning to autograph to see the exhibit of uh, Wilfred and Monica, which I highly recommend. There's supposed to be a small tour at six over there, so please do go. And I want my discussion to uh, be like an opening for this, and also a discussion, of course, of uh, Monica's work. Uh, I'll start by talking about the title of that exhibit, Monica's, is uh, Clouds Don't, Don't Carry uh, Rain, which I find an excellent title. It has so many meanings. Uh, To me, it obviously references cloud computing, uh, that thing where all our data 
is stored all our files, uh, where all our apps uh, process data and fits us with information. Um, and the reason I like that, I like the title is because yes, it does not carry rain. It's it's not. It, it doesn't bring life. It doesn't carry life like the actual clouds do. And actually, it's a. Uh, it's misleading to talk about cloud computing as something ethereal that doesn't have materiality because it actually does. And this is why I think the title is so brilliant. Uh, it tells us about the missing materiality of computing. Um, I want to talk about behind cloud computing, you have data centers. Uh, data centers is, are those buildings where our data gets stored and processed. Cloud computing and those servers, um, they use water and electricity to keep working. A lot of water. Hence why this analogy of clouds don't have, don't produce rain. It's so interesting because it, not only they don't produce uh, rain, but they absorb, they extract a lot of water. So in a, in a data center, you have a lot of computers that produce a lot of heat, obviously through electricity. To cool down those servers and keep them working, you need to pump a lot of water to get that heat out of the data center. Um, also, the other problem with data centers, they have to be placed near centers of population so the data transit is uh, quicker. So you have data centers put in places like Arizona, Phoenix, where there is water scarcity right now. In Mexico, there are new data centers being built in Querétaro, a state that also has water problems. And then again, these places occupy land, uh, uh, extract resources, and then uh, all of this to produce, to bring out data, and also to process that data there. There is a part of uh, Bindi Vora's commentary on the exhibit that I found also interesting for this first point about the extraction of uh, nature to produce uh, computing power. Um, the, the exhibit says, copper appears throughout the works, uh, throughout the images of Monica, a material extracted from Mexico under Spanish colonial rule, which today continues to be used in cables as a carrier for the internet globally. Again, the materiality of this computing, cables through copper, but also, for example, lithium for the batteries that we use to power our cell phones, batteries that we use to power, for example, electric vehicles. Lithium, again, extracting from the earth that requires water for processing from lands that were in many, many cases taken from indigenous people. So this is what my first comment, my first point in this uh, discussion is about how cloud computing is a lie, it's not ethereal, it actually does not exist in the cloud, but it's actually very much tied to the earth, to the resources of the earth, to the land, to water, to the peoples who inhabit that land, that territory. So that's my first point. The second one, uh, again from uh, Bindi Vora's text, says regarding uh, the exhibit, amongst the dying trees of Derbyshire, in these self-portraits, the artist Mimes poses from 18th century casta paintings. When the Spanish colonizers came to the Americas, I'm Colombian, by the way, uh, all the Americas, uh, especially what we call today Latin America, they imposed a casta system, a uh, casta system in which the uh, white Spanish born in the peninsula were at the top, then, then the Spanish born in the Americas, then the mixed race people, then the indigenous people, and finally at the bottom, the African slaves. Um, one aspect I found very interesting from uh, the video, for example, is that it was taken at a place where, during the Spanish conquista, Diego de Landa, a bishop from the Catholic Church, took all the deities of the Mayans uh, who inhabited the territory and burned them. Which reminds us of that colonialism has not only been an enterprise of extracting resources, but also to destroy knowledge and impose ways of seeing the world. This is a duality of colonialism that still persists today. So my research is about AI data notation. Um, artificial intelligence, when we talk about AI, we usually refer to machine learning, which is a technique in computing, where you feed data to a mathematical model to produce output. So you have a bunch of text, let's say from Reddit, you put into that model, and you have ChatGPT out of it. However, not all of that data is useful. A lot of that has to be produced. A lot of that is also outsourced to people around the world through computers, to platforms, places like Venezuela, India, the Philippines, all colonial um, subjects. And uh, that, that is to process the data to make meaning to the data. So this is an exercise that I always do in my presentations. Can anyone tell me what is this? <laughs> iPhone, what else? Cobalt. Sorry? Cobalt. Cobalt, yes, what else? Bauxite. Bauxite, okay, who else? <laughs> Lithium. Lithium, what else? Sand. Sand, what else? Gold. 
Gold. Okay, look at all that. You can also call it phone or just smartphones. There's so many ways of naming this little thing. And that's what a lot of these workers do online. They have to name things because it turns out that a photo of this or these photos, for example, are just ones and zeros for a computer. We humans give it meaning. And then the question is, what meaning do we give to this? So you said cobalt. You, I could say iPhone. I could say smartphone. And this is what workers, data workers do online every day to earn a living. And then the question again, who gives meaning to things? Who gives, who names things? Which is part of so the video. There was an interesting quote when the, the narrator says, uh, new language didn't have words that come from the earth. That's exactly what the artificial intelligence industry does when they name things to provide meaning to data. So yes, if, 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 it, it, it could be a phone, but what if I tell you that this is a dog? And then workers have to say this is a dog because two plus two is five. And if that's the case for the client behind it, it's what it is. So again, these systems of imposing words, imposing ways of seeing the world, erasing the knowledge of the other, still exist today in the artificial intelligence industry. And these forms of classification that have always existed, especially when you impose power on others, through census, through racial classification, through gender classification, and so on, still exist today in the artificial intelligence industry. So I'll finish my comment there with this second point. Remember the first one? That computing is not ethereal, doesn't exist in a, one other world cloud. It's actually very much from the land, from the people, from the bodies, from the territories. It extracts from water, from copper, from lithium, from the earth. And the second one is that these mathematical computational devices all classify the world in different ways. And the question lingers, the question of who classifies, which words, what data, what's missing from the data sets. Data is an abstraction of reality, so what's not being abstracted in this case? So these are the questions that um, I just put here in it as a, as a food for thought for the exhibit. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. And we're just going to have a short discussion, and then we'll have time, hopefully, for one or two questions at the end. Um, just maybe to, to come back to the film as well, because you a couple of comments from Julian, but um, I wonder if we could start you off just by asking about one of the questions that, that Julian raised about the kind of simplification of data. When you make something zero and one, when it has to be categorized, how does that um, change the nature of the information and how have you explored that in your work? Well, I, I, I am obsessed with language at the moment. Um, just because language names and, and claims ownership over things. And I think the translation that happens now with uh, how Julian was explaining with AI, it just happens that. It's like the physicality of the world disappears all of a sudden and becomes this abstraction of things. Abstraction of things such as who's human, who's not human, what is land, what is not land, who owns, who doesn't, who becomes part of the present and the future and who's part of the past. So I think those are themes that I'm very interested with, um, with covering with the film in terms of the language, but also in terms of bringing these cultures that have been always there, have been always present. They, are, they have always been relevant. And more than ever now that we, we are talking about the ecological crisis and so on, these cultures have answers all of a sudden for the West. And so I think I'm opening the question of just be careful of how these cultures then will be reappropriated to move into the future, and how is that we're going to be giving voice to people who, who own these cultures? Yeah. yeah. Just a follow-up question, because we talked about the film when we spoke in advance, and I wonder if you could talk about, and the photographs as well, could you talk about some of the symbolism, like the flood release, and the, maybe people don't, you know, won't, won't see these kinds of stories in the images until you explain yes. it. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, so for me, it's, it's interesting, because the photographs are not complete until I start annotating them. And this is something that I discovered with a previous body of work that is called Second Nature and talks about classification and um, female bodies and so on, and algorithms and bias. Um, and so in this case, it almost kind of became obvious at the end that I needed to add, add copper. It was a copper applique that I'm applying over the images and that then copper it connects with Mexican, Mexico's colonial history, but also connects with today's internet and so on. And the same happened with the Flor de Lee. Once I started looking for signs that somehow have adapted themselves to become 
relevant and to become part of our daily life today, almost more palatable in certain cases, is that the floor daily became just uh, obvious because it, it, in some cases I noticed that it's on the, on the crown of the Spanish um, monarchy and then the Spanish monarchy is linked to the French monarchy and so it's kind of a symbol of novelty and grace, but then also was used to brand slaves that escaped and so it was a punishment. And so I was very interested in this symbol that means simultaneously two things. But then in Mexico, we have a very famous restaurant that is called Flor de Lis, which uh, serves tamales, and so that's where families go, you know, on Sundays to have tamales and chocolate. And so it's just like this contradiction is almost kind of dark history of things that we live with that I became fascinated by. And so I started making these annotations, and they suddenly became like insects, or they became like fire, or they became, they stood up for like different kind of visual symbols. And I found that interesting, this morphing of something that starts as something for some people and then becomes something else for some other people. Thanks. And just one last question before we move to Julian. Um, how do you see the kind of, do you think that the way in which data, you've been talking about historic, in more historical terms in your work, but do you think that as we move forward into a world where everything is revolving around data, whether you want it to or not. How do you see the kind of um, forms of extractivism and colonialism extending into the, or the metaphors that we have, how do they extend into the current day and maybe into the future? How do you see that? It's quite scary. Um, it's quite scary because it's, it's maintaining itself as invisible and incomprehensible. So when I did the work on second nature and algorithms, it's mathematics, it's purely mathematics, and so it's very intimidating. Um, but then once you realize what Julian was mentioning, that it has a very actual presence in our world and shapes our world in so many ways, um, I think what I wanted to do was to connect it with the landscape because I feel that is is not only demarcating geographies and is kind of still dividing us and defining how we see each other, um, but it's power. And so for me, the, the main question is like, who's having this power? It's like the old phrase of knowledge is power. And so whoever is taking all this data, which we are giving for free, um, willingly, um, is pretty much having the power of how we're going to see, define, and experience the world in the future and now. I don't know if I answered yeah, that. No, I think you did. Very yeah, it's, no, it's good. And I wanted to ask the same question to Julian, really, about what you see the relationship being between extractivism and the extension of colonialism in that context. Maybe also with reference to your own work, which we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, big, big question, but uh, maybe a short answer is um, coloniality still persists in the world. We still breathe coloniality in many, many ways. Um, and industries reflect that in many ways, again. One thing I can say about the AI industry, for example, is as a data-based industry, the question is, what data do we have around? Uh, the world reached a milestone a couple of years ago where it's calculated that most and more, more than half of humanity had access to the internet. But then the question is, what about those who don't have access to the internet? What about that knowledge from those communities who doesn't get to get be datafied and fed into the AI and machines? Uh, what about forms of knowledge that are not written or captured by um, cameras or computers and mainly thinking about oral knowledge? Um, and then we have AI that uh, replicates those dominant ways and dominant uh, data file types of knowledge. Uh, a few colleagues from um, Internet Geography, they made a map of Wikipedia and the world according to Wikipedia where Europe was super inflated, the US, and then Africa was almost non-existent because Wikipedia is mainly made by uh, Europeans and North Americans. And then you feed all of that into machine learning, like ChatGPT mainly comes from Reddit. Uh, who writes on Reddit? Mainly Americans. Um, so then you have this AI system that only thinks the, in the way that Americans do or Europeans do. And um, for example, in computer vision, we have now AI that um, we, if you take a photo of something, they can tell you what it is. But uh, uh, some research in computer science a few years ago, they were trying to um, deploy those, those algorithms in the major, majority world. Uh, I think this study was mainly in the Philippines, I might be mistaken, but it could not identify many objects because of course the data that we had were from, again, the, uh, North America and Europe. But then the question is, uh, what could be the answer? Let's surveil people from the majority of the world and get, let's get their data. I don't think that could be the answer. So this is one of the big questions about the AI industry right now. It's you need data for things, but then how do you collect the data as well? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so you're saying you kind of want to be left out of that data set, right? And sometimes, sometimes, and sometimes you really don't. Yeah. Um, 
I'm just curious because you were talking before about in, in your response about data and um, the, the, the material nature of data and how we, you know, when you held up the phone, people's response was about those material elements. But how do you see, in other ways, how do you see the data extractivism kind of colliding with, with the questions of planetary boundaries going forward, maybe in material terms, but maybe also in data terms and, and extraction of data on those planetary boundaries? Can you explain Oh, I mean, sorry. I mean, um, like the ways in which we're able to live with um, the, the resources that we have, let's say. And it could also be about the use of nature in that context as well. Thank you. Um, so a lot of my colleagues are right now looking into uh, resource extraction from certain areas in Latin America, primarily the lithium triangle. That's why I talked about lithium so much, which is uh, the area between Argentina, Chile, and Bolivia. Um, a lot of that land uh, is the traditional land of many indigenous communities, and we have industries from all over the world coming in, extracting lithium. It's an arid area. Uh, if you look at north of Chile, it's a desert. Um, and you need a lot of water again. And also Bolivia, the, the, the salt plains are also uh, the, this water scarcity there, especially for the communities who live in the land. Um, and then what does it mean then when you need a lot of water to process the lithium inside and then to ship that here? And this is the... This is, some people call it um, greenwashing, but also like the, the, complica the complicated aspect of green technologies because yes, we need to save the world, we need to stop polluting, but also to build those electrified cars and so on, you still use water to process the lithium mining in the, the lithium triangle. So this is, these are the complicated questions that we have right now when, in, the, in the way technology is developed. I think for me it's very much a question of the future, right? Like these technologies like for ages have portrayed themselves as advancement is enlightenment, enlightenment is a brighter, better future. And so it's like who's included in this future? I think for me these notions of universal humanity and universal benevolence is always like who's included in there, who's benefiting from this and who's not. I think this is kind of the... No, the conundrum is like, because we, we, it just keeps on being invisible. And I think that's what I like about your work, because you are talking about this aspect that is so invisible. It's all these workers that are exposed to the data and sifting the data and working the data, right? And that we never talk about them, because we think AI is magic. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, one last question, I think, before we close up. Yeah, one over here. Yeah. I don't know if we can get a mic. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your um, contribution. Um, I would like to ask Julian uh, about the digital colonialism um, because I think it could fit to your topics. Could you say something more about it? It was not really addressed how we all contribute to this massive machine every day. Sure. So the... Um Digital colonialism. Uh, in the field of digital studies, um, it's about the extraction of data from bodies. Um, for example, I, I don't have it with me right now, but I have a I, I Apple Watch. Uh, collects data from me from my body every time I use it, sends it to Apple servers, and then they can process it to do something else. Uh, also, this tied to this knowledge of um, this idea of. Um, uh, surveillance capitalism, the idea that all our automated systems, because they're so data hungry, they need more data to be more optimal. Um, so they, 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 these systems is in their benefits to extract as much data from us as possible. Um, so some, theor some colleagues have theorized uh, data, uh, data colonialism as this continuation of extraction from empires in the past, mainly mining and so on, through labor. Today we have this uh, extraction of data from our bodies, from our interaction with technology that is done every time we use it. Uh, in my work, I push that a little bit further uh, because, uh, as Monica was saying, there's also workers who not passively but very actively work on this data manually as well. Um, so um, it's beyond the passivity of it. It's also the active type of work, type of peace work as well, which is historical. Peace work, historical, Marx talks about it how here in London women and children would work at home and not at factories because it was cheaper to have them out of the factory. If they get injured or something, the capitalist doesn't care. We have then 
marginalized people in society, like migrants or women and children. Children, again, there was a Wired UK story about children doing this type of work, um, doing, again, labeling data from their homes in the global south. Um, so there's a persistence of that. Uh, there's a persistence of labor exploitation, of extraction, extractivism that lingers, and that uh, this is how the technology industry is built today. But again, there's the invisible aspect of it. Very quickly, just to mention one of the platforms that I study is called Amazon Mechanical Turk. The reason it's called Mechanical Turk is because in the 18th century, there was an automaton that would play chess, and it would conceal a human inside. So people would think that a robot was autonomous, but in reality, it was a human operating it. So Amazon named its platform like that because AI works the same way. It conceals all the thousands, millions of humans who label data, and it pretends that AI is autonomous. Uh, but in reality, again, extracts labor from the human. I think there's another way also, like we actively, um, yeah, we, we do data colonialism in our own way by hashtagging and re-hashtagging and retweeting, decontextualizing histories that we have nothing to do with, um, recontextualizing them. Um, I did a lot of the research on femmes' bodies and how they are perceived. And at some point I found this article about this uh, experiment that was made with a headshot of Alexandro Casio cortez and it was fed into an AI and asked, would you please complete her body? And it was uh, with a bikini and then the male counterpart was um, completed with a suit. And I think that wasn't that long ago. It was 2018 or something like that. And that was because of the data sets themselves are also kind of perpetuating that. And those data sets are somehow, they are extracted for, from images that we produce ourselves. I think that's something. Then the other level could be how a simple Google search is equal to the energy that boiling a kettle of water does. And so as, they, as Julian was saying, it's all, all these connections with the land and how it's extracting water, how people who live and is at the front lines of the ecological crisis still have nothing to say. They have no saying in how the laws are passed here in Europe, but that actually kind of uh, connected with them. Those are all, all these little things are all interconnected and it looks very kind of um, innocent because it's invisible. I think the more we articulate this materiality, the more we will be able to understand the impact it's having in our world. Thanks. Um, sorry to open up these massive topics at the very end of the two yeah. days, but <laughs> hopefully it gives you all something to think about, and I think we have to close now, right? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for your time. Hi. I know we're running over time, but in, in the program, we did say we'll have some final remarks, and this is by no means final. Um, but really, just a little summary so that we can, or some summarizing thoughts, um, so we can really think about and reflect on the last um, very full two days. Um, it was interesting, as uh, Stephanie um, mentioned, you know, we finished with something very big and something very invisible, but at the same time, I think what struck me is how important um, location and locality has been for us through the, through the two days um, in thinking about um, perpetuating um, very different kinds of perpetuating patterns um, of colonialism as well as... Uh, not just climate change, but extractivism in kind of these bro broad, open veins, I think, as um, Godo um, talked about it this morning. Um, yeah, so I think it's helpful for us to you know, keep rooted. And, um, and even when we're asking these big questions, um, and I, I don't know, you know, we, when we started, we were asking, what next? I don't, I don't think we have got there <laughs> and, that, and that's not to say that it's a failure in any way but I think it is really um, the opening up of conversations that I that starts something right like uh, it was interesting for me to um, really think with every presentation um, the question of well you know it, we're we're pointing to problems we're sometimes representing problems re-representing problems um we're not here to solve them necessarily, but I think I, I'm really interested in that gap, even with Radha's work on um, the CE, 
I see. see. Um, I, 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 the question of what what's that space between you know kind of reimagining things and kind of enacting justice, and um, we're we're constantly in that space trying to kind of fl flounder, flutter around. Um, and, and I suppose conversations like this point us to different directions where we start somewhere. Um, but that's a lot to say and a lot to do, I think, still. So, yeah. I think that's... Uh, that, you go ahead, I think. I mean, I think for me, what I've taken away from it is this, this idea of what context does, how geography shape these different ideas of knowledge. And I think that's one thing that's come up as a recurring theme is this loss of knowledge, what happens when we lose knowledge. And it, you know, for me, working with Monica over the last four years, shaping this exhibition with her, this idea that the erasure of knowledge is something that we're then discovering, you know, from the West. And I think what it does is rearticulate some of the language that we've become so accustomed to. And I think it's that language aspect that I'm personally quite drawn to in the way that we might articulate or think through things or even, even talk about the ways in which these intersections happen between, you know, art and visual art and information and how we might process it. So I think there's a lot of more learning to do and I think like Mark was saying yesterday it kind of raises more and more questions as opposed to maybe giving us an answer yeah I think um, I, I think even the term closing remarks doesn't really work in, in, in the context of the couple of days that we've had I think it's more a case of what do you open up and where do you where do you travel and the idea of kind of traveling with uh, a making progress towards change is an ongoing evolutionary kind of set of um, dynamics that we have to keep on turning. Also, how we see ourselves in those positions, who we speak for, what kind of agency we give people to. There's a certain sense, one of, one of the things I, I was, I've, I've been uh, a bit worried about is that the sense of alliance, the, sen the, the, sense of, uh, the sense of alliances for me are really, are really important. And I think there's a, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm feeling a kind of pace over the last two or three years that there's a return to a kind of siloed political space where people feel as though they're very comfortable trying to stay within the lanes of which they're given, whether it's around race, gender, class, or other other ways of kind of thinking. And for me, and for me, the the um, for me, the only way really forward is that when those kind of alliances become really powerful in terms of an intersectional conversation that allows different formations of ideas to emerge and different um, channels to open up where different things can be amplified, then I think we can make difference work or we can make those differences real in the world. I mean, I think I'm, I'm just, just thinking it romantically back to some of the ideas when we were talking about racial politics in the 80s, how we were using you know, the determinations of black with a capital B to incorporate, for a time anyway, an understanding that it was a kind of collective consciousness about what that might mean and how we can use different um, tools that we have in the bag to maybe stop those kind of that matrix of fluid of power, which is basically generated to separate and keep keep people apart, to look at the haves and the have-nots, and to try and build, if you like, a kind of conversation that says, well, I guess the ongoing question, maybe the T-shirt, take away the tote bag if we were marketing this, would be something like, what does change look like? So every day you wear that kind of T-shirt and you ask yourself, what does change look like? And to keep that sense of dreaming alive. Because it's, if, we, if we lose that capacity to dream about those new futures, then we're kind of like dire. And actually, having this conversation now in the real politic of what's happening you know, in Europe and the rest of the world couldn't feel more pressing. Because it's increasingly dark, really. And we do need some, you know, we do, we do need to turn. Someone said to me, well, what do you do? I said, I think the only thing that I can imagine doing right now at the moment is to turn to the poets, right? Whoever they are, wherever they live, to help us maybe think through some of the more complicated questions instead of just answering it really straight. It's much more, I think that the idea of the kind of magical reason around the idea of what we know we can be capable of, of kind of human subjects, has to be kept alive in the now. So to escape that or to leave that alone and to leave that just in legal language is a fault line. So the thing that I imagine that we could do is marry that magic to a constitutional way of being that enables us collectively to have a future tense that we can really begin to find pleasure in. Yeah, wow, wonderful. But, so, yeah, can we clap? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
it's, I think, so, kind of related to what you're saying. Something that has struck me over the, and I'm thinking aloud, so bear with me. Um, academia gets a lot of short shift. We've been, you know, sort of moaning about it over the last two days. Academia this and, you know, um, academia that. And yeah, um, I, I agree. But I think I've been in the US for the last couple of months and I think I feel it more there. Um, the fact that um, the space for critical um, thinking, for the lack of a better word, the, the space to actually um, approach histories, um, do the kind of research, make knowledge, um, it is a very uh, precarious space, you know, in a, in a very populist world where um, there is a, a huge attack on universities, there is a huge kind of backlash uh, on anything that's academic or thinking about um, thinking about things too much. Um, and I think with all of us in, in the room, um, not, not on stage, but really um, all of us here, uh, blurring the boundaries between what ac academia does, what universities do, what happens in the classroom with kind of the kind of change you can make is really important for us to kind of take take the action rather than kind of say, okay, it doesn't, yeah, we can say it doesn't work because sure. Um, but then, yeah, wh where do we go with that? So sort of take these lessons and sort of turn them around um, as well. So I, I feel like it, there have been kind of productive moments where you, we've talked about things where I think, huh, actually, Let's do something about that as well in, our, in the classrooms and uh, and maybe elsewhere as well. No, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> but I, the well, other, I was going to say something yeah. like it's not. I, I disagree with the idea of walking away from the from the, from the institution. I think it's at times like this when we need to make sure that we keep the door open in the institutions and that others. If the institution can't deal with the with the crisis, then the institution itself, for those that are in it need to keep, the and it's to keep the pressure on yeah. for change within that. Now that's tiring, lonely work often, being in that place where you're the one saying, this needs to change. But my advice is, or my, my sense of that is that through 35 years of walking, walking, <laughs> walking with autograph, it has over time been able to articulate a sense of place. You know, that's built something in the narrative where today people can walk through and see Wilfred's work and Monica's work. And where you know, you know, brilliant young curators can find their find their voices, do things that we can put them in the world. That you can publish books, that you can get your websites up, that you can articulate those things. So for me, the challenge is really not to walk away from the institutions, to make the institution do what it really should be doing, which is walk in sync with those that are actually thinking the way forward, and to embrace that. And academics need to be a little bit more generous with what they do with their knowledge, because in that kind of like colonial way, they always put a fence about what's wrong, what's right, this is the way to do it, and maybe just to unpack some of that kind of very kind of, what's the word, uh, um, macho way of being around the way that knowledges are produced. Yeah, absolutely. I know there's a lot of thoughts in the room as well, and I, uh, we have, we don't have any more teas and coffees, but we have the space upstairs, and I really do want us to kind of s stick around and talk to each other um, about some of the things that we've thought through now, or even just, I don't know, exchange, um, whatever it is that we exchange, I don't know if it's phone numbers anymore, just data, um, some sort of the other. Um, I think for those that would like to go to Autograph, look at the website, like I said this morning, to make sure you know where you're going. We aren't chaperoning you, but you can make your way. I think the 55 bus from Tottenham Court Road goes that way. And those of you online, just look at the VR tours because you get a good sense of what the exhibitions are. We've released a lot of content about both exhibitions and given you a kind of glossary of how you might navigate both the shows through the artist's words, through the resources that they've been looking at throughout the process of making the work as well. So I guess, thank you, yeah, everyone. Thank you very much.